Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So all the way back in January, very, very quickly, um, let's go over what I said. Um, I said, and I finished with this, these particular words, that the challenge of looking at be fruitful and increase in number. As we started the year, my challenge for us as individuals and as a church was to be fruitful and increase in number over this past year that has happened. We're not quite there at the end yet of the year. Um, but uh, I, the danger, dangerous thing I said was that if we don't see fruit and increase in number, we need to change what we are doing. Now that's for me as the individual. So am I seeing fruit in my life? God's, God's fruitfulness. So there is obviously the fruits of the Spirit, but also actually the fruits of my labor as well in that. And if I'm not, I need to change what I'm doing because I'm doing something wrong. And I think, and this is the, the very dangerous part of applying it to the church because there's definitely the second half. So be fruitful. That's good. That as a church, as a leadership team, we say, are we encouraging people in discipleship? Are we encouraging people to grow in their faith, to, to start seeing buds of life, buds of growth in their life? But also, are we seeing growth within our church? Now, I think, and this is where I really struggle greatly with, is not to literally, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is to count every Sunday how many people we have. And if we, if we you know, from, from last week to this week to next week, you know, if we're seeing numbers go up, is that all that matters? And I, and I think it's not all that matters, but within that, I think there is also a, a sign that says that if we're not numerically growing, we do need to maybe change how we're doing things. Because what it means is in, th th there's no such thing in church as being static. It's always going to go down. You know, if we stay as we are, A, we're a holy huddle. I think there's a slight danger within looking after ourselves. But actually what it really means is that we're not going out there and encouraging people into faith. That, that they then have a desire and say, I want to know more about what it is to be part of this Christian faith. And the place that I can find that is where these lot meet, which is usually a Sunday morning. So the point of a growth on a Sunday morning is about actually that people who are using the phrase out there want to grow in faith. So that's what we talked about all the way back in January. In February, it wasn't February, it was May. Um, uh, the second part was fill the earth and subdue it. Now I said I preferred, uh, there's, there's a version of the Bible called the voice. And in that, they use a phrase, I will make you trustees of my estate. And I said I preferred that kind of concept and idea of that. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more today because there's obviously naturally a little bit of crossover with the last part and, uh, and the part before. So we have been given two directives from God and from Jesus to fill the earth and subdue it. Now, part of that is, is looking at it means to make the earth useful for human beings, benefit and for their enjoyment. 
to go to the ends of the earth and make disciples. For me, it was these two fitting together. Jesus' words of go to the ends of the earth and make disciples and fill the earth and subdue it fit together. I believe Jesus is reminding us of our calling from the Garden of Eden given to the first humans. Now, I think this is fascinating and really worth bearing in mind that when God said this to the human beings, to Adam and Eve, this was pre-sin. And so I think that actually, as we are in post-sin, well, not quite, we're in sin, aren't we? Not in post-sin. That'd be great, wouldn't it? If it was post-sin, we're not. We're in sin. Is the fact that this means even more, I believed. So that's what we looked at uh, in May. And today, the third part of this sermon, okay, is the last part. So it's rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Now, this was given to Adam and Eve. Now, I believe that this is also, and the whole of it, is for us today as well. To rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Now, a little thing really to say before I really kind of fully get into this is I'm not, and maybe I should be, but I'm not an environmental activist. So my knowledge of the environmental issues, I'll be very honest, and maybe to my shame, is extremely limited. Now, it's not that I don't care necessarily about the environment, but I haven't made it a priority in my life. Now, hopefully at the end of this uh, sermon, I might uh, change my, my viewpoint upon that and see that maybe it needs to be slightly higher. As we know, in recent years, there has been this organization um, in the past three or four years that have come, come about called Extinction Rebellion. And if I'm very honest, I don't know too much about them, but I don't know how I feel about Extinction Rebellion. And we're going to come on to them in a, in a little bit and look at what they are doing of, and I, I won't kind of here to kind of critique them, that's not what this sermon's about, but actually I want to pull from what they're doing some good things, that actually as Christians we can say, maybe we can learn from them. So now I might have already divided you, I don't know, uh, and we're not going to take a vote or, or kind of um, any kind of people's opinions, uh, we can leave that to the tea and coffee after the service. Um, but I don't know if I've divided the room already when talking about this group, Extinction Rebellion, and what you think of it, whether, yes, they are the best thing ever, or actually they are too destructive for what they're doing. I don't know. And I'm not here also to tell you to stop using fossil fuels. I'm not here to say this is what you should or this is what you should not do. It is, it is down to, hopefully, as Christians, and I guess the points of, of sermons is to, is, is to show you and, and give you ideas to say how you can, because I think you need to take, and I need to take, control of my own faith. That actually I can't just give my faith to the church and say, you make me grow as a Christian. I need to grow myself in God, obviously, naturally so. So it's down, actually, these things are down to uh, how you interpret what I'm, what I'm going to say to how, therefore, you need to act or you feel you need to act upon this. Right. Um, now, I think as a Christian, we can have two or we can have different opinions coming on we we that there are certain things that we as christians are all going to agree on so um it's what i like to call a primary principle okay so for example a primary principle would be that jesus is god 
that if we're saying that Jesus is not God, okay, then I personally have, will struggle uh, with you calling yourself a Christian if you're saying that Jesus is not God, okay? And hopefully, we're not going to take a poll, but hopefully that will be the same for everybody. I'll be, I'm too scared to take a poll, I'll be honest. <laughs> Just in case. Um, uh, anyway, let's move on quickly. Um, and then there are those things that I like to call secondary principles. So those things as Christians that we, uh, we disagree on. And I think actually it's right that we say there are things in the Christian faith that we will disagree about. And what's really important is we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And actually, we need to learn to disagree with each other well. And so, as I said, what I like to call secondary principles. And so, what I'm going to be talking about today is what I like to call a secondary principle. The conclusion that I draw might be different from the conclusion that you draw. You might at the end of the sermon say, actually, yes, I need to go out now and, and buy an electric car. I need to stop using fossil fuels. I need to do this or that. And for somebody else, it might be, actually, that's not where I want to be. That's not what God is, is telling to me. And I think it's, it's worth noting that that is fine. That actually, there are uh, things that we will disagree about, and that's okay. So, um, let's just read this little bit and get it right. So, I'd like to put forward the idea that this part of the verse actually is both primary and secondary bit of theology. Okay, so the secondary bit is really easy to deal with, okay? Um, because, let me read that again. The secondary bit is easy to bring across. How we complete God's instruction in this verse is down to our passion priority, okay? So, I've not made sense of that myself, so you've probably not made sense of it either. So what I'm basically I'm trying to say in that, that how we go about uh, putting this rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground, how we put that principle into play in our own lives is going to be different. I'm going to be doing it differently to you. You're going to be doing it differently to your neighbour. But the principle, or the primary principle, is I believe we need to complete God's instruction. So, we cannot, so in other words, we cannot ignore the fact that God has told us to rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Are you almost with me on that? Thank you. I know it's a bit kind of like, where is he going with all of that? Um, but thank you for keeping with me. So there are primary and secondary principles. The primary principle is I must do something about God's instruction to me from Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. The secondary principle is how I do that is going to be different to my neighbours. So the question I have is why do I see this as a primary principle? Because God has asked us. It is as simple as that. God has asked us to rule. Now, I think we need to look at this word rule because there is that idea of ruling as a powerful dictator. It is mine I would do as I wish. And I think, and I'm going to be honest, part of me, and I think this is what I've begun to learn, part of me is this whole, it's okay. Do you know what? When the end times come, when Jesus comes back again, we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth. So therefore, I can do what I wish with this world. So to be maybe a slight extreme of this, 
I can abuse the word. As a Christian, I can justify myself. I can totally abuse this world and take absolutely everything from it because God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth anyway. And actually, in my theology, I could go a bit further and say, actually, if I actively destroy this world, that will bring on the second coming quicker. So actually, if I destroy this planet, then God has to act. Jesus has to come back and we get a new heaven and a new earth. That could be a theology uh, that we could hold And maybe not to that far extent, but I think as I grew up, there was that kind of concept and idea that it doesn't matter because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But I have to dismiss that because if I go back a few verses in Genesis chapter 1, and actually the very first verses, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to what I call 3a, so just the first part of chapter 3, a verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't Jonathan or anybody else. Actually, I can't be a dictator because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be. Dot, dot, dot. Everything. Basically, through and because of God and nothing to do with us. As I mentioned uh, a little earlier about that whole idea of fill the earth and subdue it, of Jesus, of, of, sorry, uh, the voice version saying that actually we are just trustees of God's estate. We are rulers only as caretakers. We should be, should we be doing whatever we feel, or should we be doing what is right for the owner of this world? And that, to me, I think, is a really strong challenge of how we take care of this planet. I don't know if you've um, ever done any gardening for somebody else at all, if you've had that privilege of uh, cutting somebody's grass or otherwise. I um, used to work uh, many years ago, um, used to cycle two, two and a half miles uh, to a, an, an older gentleman's uh, very large uh, garden uh, and had the job with my friend of mowing the lawn every Friday afternoon. Uh, we used to cycle all the way up the hill uh, to, to cut, his, cut his grass. And... We cut his grass the way that he wanted it doing. We used his equipment, his petrol, and all he used was our, um, I like to say our muscles, but I'm not going to go too far (laughs) on that respect. Uh, It wasn't slave labor either um, at all. Um, And with one particular lawn, he had two mowers. With one particular lawn, he had um, a roller on it, and the other mower, it didn't. And the one lawn, he wanted to have the roller on it to get the stripes. And, that, and he wanted the stripes to go. And this is, he was a lovely, lovely gentleman. He wanted the stripes to go what, that way and not across ways. And so what do we do? We do it as he requires of it. Because it is his lawn. It's not my lawn that I can go, actually, I've decided I want to dig that bit up and put a flower bed in. No, if he asked me to do that, that's what I would do. So in that sense of being caretakers of this planet, maybe we need to go back to the owner and find out what he wants. So back to Extinction Rebellion. What do I like about them? I'm not going to look at all the things I don't like. I want to just be positive about this particular part. What they have done 
whether we like it or not, is they have brought the problem that is in this world into the public's light. You cannot uh, say that they, they have not been um, active in telling people what they believe the issues are today, for today, not for tomorrow, but actually for today. There is a matter of factness and a clearness in their urgency to act now before it is too late. And there isn't necessarily one type of person that is involved. It's all walks of life that have signed up to be part of Extinction Rebellion. I don't know if you can remember, for those who are uh, like me, old enough, that remembers um, Swampy climbing up the tree. Was it Swindon or Swindon or, or kind of uh, Wiltshire Way? I think he climbed up a tree and he chained himself to a tree for about four weeks or so um, because they wanted to cut down this tree. And um, if I say um, it was a type of person that was part of that activist group, they were all, you know, I think the papers were a little bit cruel on them of being no hopers and, and people that didn't have jobs. But actually what you find with Extinction Rebellion is almost the opposite. Then actually you have some, some, some uh, uh, well, I think if I remember rightly, there is, there's been doctors and all sorts of different types of people that have been part of Extinction Rebellion. So people that actually have decided that I'm gonna take time off my work to, to be active about this particular problem because it's a problem that we need to address now. It's a problem that is gonna affect our children enough that I'm gonna stop working for a period of time to be part of this movement, whether it be for a day, whether it be for a week. And so, from the news, this is what I've seen about this group, Extinction Rebellion. Now, actually, I think, do you know what? There are some things that they have got right in campaigning. That actually, I know, because of Extinction Rebellion, that the planet is in dire straits. Whether we agree with that or not, you cannot take away that that is what they have presented very powerfully to us as a nation, to the world. As a side issue, Jonathan Keir, the Christian, how passionate is he about the problem that is in the world, the problem of sin? When I look at our churches across the Forest of Dean, across our nation, maybe I can't quite say across the world because there is, in other parts of the world, there is great growth that is happening. But just maybe I can learn from Extinction Rebellion about their passion, about their, the way that actually they have brought the problem or brought the problem to the public's light. How well is Jonathan Keir doing about telling the world that sin is the greatest problem in people's lives? Am I doing it as, good, as well and as good as Extinction Rebellion? Extinction Rebellion started with just three people getting together to form this campaign. How many billions of Christians, or millions maybe, of Christians are in the world, and yet we go into schools, we go into uh, wherever we might go into, and people don't know who Jesus is. I think there's a problem there that, as a Christian, I haven't maybe been as active in my faith, in what Jesus called me to do. And I think, for me, there's that need that I need to be a positive Christian, oh sorry, a positive Christian witness in the world. 
I think sometimes organizations like Extinction Rebellion, um, just to name one, we can get fed up with because it's an inconvenience. We can go, actually, my opinion was, yes, we need to, we need to uh, do something about this planet because it's not in a good state. And Extinction Rebellion might come along and actually we go, oh, that's it, actually, I'm going to burn more fossil fuel because of it. You know, we can have that kind of attitude. And I think sometimes, in my Christian witness, do I put people on to Christ or do I put people off Christ? And I think that's a really strong challenge for us. Is my campaigning for Jesus encouraging people to come to him or pushing them further away from him. That's a little side issue. Now, remember these words uh, that we read earlier. Rule over the fish of the, in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Remember, God spoke these words before sin entered the world. And then the directive was that we care for all that is. Now, if we were needing, if God was needing us to care for this planet before sin, how much more do we need to care for it now that it is in sin? And I think, as I said before, I think that is a really strong challenge. So the context of this being part of the verse for the year what are the implications that I believe that we need to be challenged as a church over? It wasn't, a, I, I was trying to find a different word to write down, but all I came back to was this word indifference. And do I have, and my answer is yes to this, Jonathan Keir is saying yes to this, that I have an indifference to world issues. And I, and I struggle with that because it's wrong. I have a total indifference to what is actually going on out there. It is far easier for me to bury my head in the sand and actually not to have an opinion over these issues. Because Having an opinion over these issues requires me to actually study and understand what is really happening. Now, sometimes I don't want to have an issue or, or maybe vocalize my issue because I don't want to cause offense. I don't want to upset people in the church. I don't want to upset people outside of the church. So it's just far easier that I don't know. That's my answer. And sometimes... The reality is we can't be bothered with arguments. And, or maybe a better word will be kind of portraying our opinion rather than arguments. But the reality is sometimes they end up as arguments, don't they? And actually, I, oh, I just can't be bothered to get into that argument again about this, that or the other. So it's just easier to go, oh, I don't really know anything about that, sorry. It's just far easier, isn't it? Now, I think what I must stress at this point is what is the church's priority? Is the church priority? Am I sort of basically here to say this morning um, I've got the forms and we're all going to become members of Extinction Rebellion? Is that, uh, I guess that's a no from uh, over there. Um, is that what this is about? Is that what church actually is boiled down to just world issues and I think if that is all that church is then I think there's no point being church church has to be the the priority of church has to be to show the love of Jesus to everyone who doesn't know him that in itself is a big enough task alone is it not to to show the love of Jesus to those who don't know him. To, to make disciples is a first. Now, if all we do is 
um, environmental activism, or even, hey, let's just say this right now, problems with food in this world, poverty in this world, is all we do is water aid, or even the preservation of life. If all I am interested in as a Christian is saying abortion is wrong, is there any point in me being church? Now, those things are right for Christians to, if I believe it, to be involved in. We should be involved in the preservation of life. That's the beginning and actually at the end. We need to be interested about making sure that every single person in this planet has clean water. We need to be having a passion that every person in this planet has enough food to eat. But if all we do are those things, then our direction is wrong. We need to be involved in what is happening in this world, in God's world. So for me, okay, I cannot say I am not interested in entering the debate upon abortion, entering the debate on poverty, entering the debate on clean water, entering the debate on environmental issues. As a Christian, I have to be, but I also have to be as a more of a, or more of a priority is to show the love of Jesus to those who don't know him. This is God's world that we have been asked to care for environmentally and humanly. Now, the reality is, I cannot have an extremely well-informed opinion over every single issue that there is. That's why we are the body of Christ. That's why that Without picking on anybody uh, in particular, we have people in this church who are very passionate, and rightly so, about the preservation of life, that are passionate about food going to the right people, about poverty, even in this country, and about clean water, etc., etc., etc. And maybe my question is to us, is... Who is it that we need to be as Christians, as the body of Christ? Who is it that we need to be listening to in this church who have, who is informed over environmental issues? Even if it goes against our maybe immediate thoughts. Why is this important? Now, As I read this Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we are coming towards the end. As I read this, and I read all the verses, the 27 verses before, this for me, unless I'm reading it wrong, this for me are the first words, written evidence, that we have of God speaking to humanity. The first words that God spoke to humanity. So maybe there is power in this Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Maybe we need to take more note of what God's first words were to us as humans. Jesus also didn't give instructions to humanity. I'm just going to close with Mark chapter 12. Verse 28 to 30. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noting that Jesus had given them a good answer. He said to him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no greater commandment than these. Maybe a question to end. Maybe in following God's first commandment, we are also following Jesus' words. I hope that it has been food for thought. It's a little bit longer than I wanted it to be. Apologies. But for me, I have been greatly challenged by looking at environmental issues. What is my part? And more importantly, what is my part as a Christian? What is my part as a church, one of the church leaders in this? And I'm still working through it, so I've not come to a conclusion really on that. But I think it's something that as a church, we have to take very seriously. Amen.